so today I'd like to present, present our speaker. Um, we are so excited to have Dr. Adrian Irby with us. So Adrian and Irby, PhD, LPC, MCC, serves as an assistant professor of counselor education at Ohio University. She earned a doctor of philosophy and counseling from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte with a cognate in multicultural counseling. She received a master of science in counseling with a community counseling specialization from Oklahoma State University. Dr. Irby's research and scholarship focuses on multicultural and social justice issues in counseling and counselor education, including racial, cultural, and LGBTQ issues, intersectionality, identity development, and educational practices fostering cultural competence. So I'm very excited to welcome and learn from here to her here today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Adrian Irby. And with that, I will uh, pass it over to you and let you uh, take the helm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's always very awkward to hear a introduction of myself. Um, so I guess in getting this started, I just wanna say that I'm excited to be here. I love talking about mixed methods. Um, and even though I feel like when I uh, first got the invitation, invitation about qualitative analysis, I was like, me, are you sure? Because no one, no one thinks of me when they think of qualitative research, no one. <laughs> So I think that's a part of what made this exciting to me as well, is because my lane has largely been in mixed methods, um, but that critical approach has been a part of how I think about qu quantitative research as well as qualitative research and how to merge the two. Um, so that's a part of what I wanna talk with you all about today, is how you're thinking about these things um, collaboratively, but also how you're thinking about yourself as a critical researcher more broadly. And um, I know a few folks were on the previous webinar, so my goal is to really kind of bring it all together, which is a hard thing to do because I had two wonderful preceding speakers. Um, but thinking about how we pull all of this information together is kind of where I'm going to take this. Um, so just to get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint here. Okay, so you've gotten the introduction, but just to give you some background, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey into critical qualitative methodology. Um, it was not a straight line at all. I was that person that said, I don't want to do qualitative work. I don't like it. It's messy and I don't want that. <laughs> I want to do something that's clear and linear and pretty with all the boxes and all the lines, just, just the way I drew them. Unfortunately, that is not people in real life. And that's certainly not how we look at um, the complex realities of privilege, oppression, and power. And that's really how I got into this um, in a much more direct way. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about my journey. Um, I'm also gonna invite you to reflect a bit more on positionality, reflexivity, and researcher subjectivity. Um, and I'll use uh, a, a particular study that I did with a colleague, um, Dr. Connie Jones. Um, I'll share a little bit about our process in looking at all of those three things. Um, we had a team of four folks working on it. And so I'll share just a little bit about how those dynamics impacted our work. Um, then I'll move into kind of a general mixed methods designs. Obviously, mixed methods is an entire field, um, so we will not cover all of that within the time frame that we have. However, I do want to at least give some foundational pieces um, of mixed methods designs um, and thinking about critical research and how we do that intentionally. And then lastly, I invite you to explore your identity and development as critical researchers, because hopefully thinking about the first and the second webinar you're in a space now where you can think, okay, how does all of this connect with my work? And at different points in your doctoral work, it seems like everybody has um, a different space that they're coming from. And so thinking about what all of this whittles down to for you in terms of your own process, that's what I think is so important about critical methodology. So just an overview of what we're focusing on today. And of course, I'm gonna get that lovely buzz. All right, so how did I get here? Like I said, it's quite a journey. Um, I was very anti-qual. I loved reading it, <laughs> but I think a part of where I struggled is as a counselor, I think we get very embedded in these stories and that's very natural for us to sort of lean into those stories. And what I struggled with was how do I disentangle from that? Um, and I wasn't comfortable with it uh, because I knew how to approach it as a counselor, not necessarily how to approach it as a researcher. And I think that that's one of the things that was not always easily taught in research methodology classes, is that they were often taught to folks in educational research or higher education where they're not looking at stories in the same way that we look at them as counselors. And so that practitioner voice, you start conceptualizing, you start 
shifting, you start um, positioning reflections and all that in a little bit of a deeper way than you need to as a researcher. And so for me, that was just a little too sensitive to touch. And so my reaction was that. <laughs> and unfortunately though, I think that that put me in a situation where I had to then learn everything later because my questions kept coming up qualitative. Um, and that's why I really, I encourage doc students now, I'm like, follow the question, just follow the question. And that seems so obvious. And of course that's what we're supposed to do, but that's, we know that's not always how that happens. Uh, when we interview doc students, they're like, I'm a qualitative researcher, I'm a quantitative researcher. Okay. Hopefully that shifts a little bit because you learn that you have to follow your question. But I've started largely with quantitative questions. They were linear, structural equation modeling, regression, that all made sense to me. But starting to look at it from a much more complex way is where I tended to, to struggle. Um, and what I would say is that when it comes to learning about research um, and shifting your perspective, I believe that it comes from engaging with others. Um, I do have a very strong emphasis on um, intersectionality and understanding how complexity is a part of what we do. Um, the other thing I think is really important is understanding the relational aspect of research design. Um, I think the best brainstorming, the best critiques, and the best um, study comes out of interaction with other people about your ideas and your designs. Um, and so that process that is very reflexive, that has included the other two presenters, that's included Dr. Connie Jones, that's included other colleagues, um, who have really helped me understand my voice as a qualitative researcher. Um, and so that I think has been a part of that journey as well. I keep going a little bit. Um, throughout, we always talk about, you know, positionality and understanding who we are. So part of what I have um, on this side of the screen, uh, on the left side, sorry, I should probably specify, um, is something that was pulled from sort of a joint newsletter that some colleagues and I did in terms of how we understood our own positionality. And it's probably the most succinct I've ever been in my life. So I'm like, let's just put it there because I am kind of long-winded. Um, but on, this, on the right-hand side, I kind of have some background in terms of my own perspective and my own positionality. So first, I black identify. Um, I typically use the term black to identify myself. Rarely do I use African-American, although I am of African-American descent in that historical context. And uh, experience is different from other black identified folks. Um, brown skinned, I'm a cis woman, I identify as queer, um, upper middle class, suburban, raised everywhere, Chicago, Oklahoma, California, Texas, I'm sure there's other places in there that I missed. <laughs> um, but basically I describe myself as a product of the suburbs and what all that comes with in terms of largely defining these um, minoritized identities, particularly visible identities in a largely white upper middle class context. Um, so all of that plays a significant role in terms of how I think about things. Also Christian, able-bodied, educational privilege, um, and not just in terms of my own educational privilege, but also with family. I'm not the first person in my family to get a PhD, um, and even that puts me forward and gives me privilege in ways that other students and other peers did not have. Um, so even thinking about how all of those privileged identities looking and being young, which, you know, thank you, Melanin. Um, but I look young and that has a significant role in terms of how I interact with people and how people perceive me and experience me. Um, and even size privilege and how that impacts how folks see me. So one of the things that I think is so important about intersectionality is really understanding and merging how privilege and oppression shapes one another. And I think the biggest thing that people overlook when they think about their identities is that they skip over their privilege. I'm real good about talking about black issues and queer issues. Sometimes I'm not as great talking about my social class privilege and educational privilege. And so being sure that we are leading with those, that's an important part of how we have to be critical um, in terms of our research design and questioning. So just giving you a bit of context and background, um, I know that you all have hopefully watched the videos before, we're involved in those, and so thinking about how all of those factors play a role in how you are shaping identity and shaping your research designs as well. So, I'm gonna shift forward a little bit. James Baldwin is in just about everything I do. He's all over my office, he's in every PowerPoint I've probably ever given, um, because he is just amazing, and I love him so much. Um, but 
one of the things that I love about the way that he talks is that everything about his way of speaking and engaging was critical. Um, and it was always rooted in a critique of power and privilege, um, whether it be through a, um, a novel or through an essay or a speech. Um, and so for me, I really just resonate with that. Um, but something, a quote that really stands out to me when I think about our profession um, is this quote here, the price one pays for pursuing any profession or calling is an intimate knowledge of its ugly side. And I think when it comes to critical methodology, we have some ugly stuff in mental health. Um, and again, to me, this goes back to privilege. Whether or not we were a part of actually enacting some of the harm that we have caused different populations in, this, in our fields is irrelevant. We are inextricably linked to that harm. And so our role as critical researchers means that we have to be active in dismantling that and active in inviting folks in to share their stories and not just demanding that they tell us who they are and why they are and how they are um, the way that we often expect in research. So I think that that's an important piece and an important positioning, not just of ourselves, but also of our profession. If you are going forward and doing counseling research, you need to understand the work and the role of counseling in labeling homosexuality as a mental disorder, in labeling black people as um, overly paranoid or childlike or any number of things that have been pushed forward um, with women. There's just so many things. And so we have to own that and hold that privilege as we engage in designing our research and trying to get other folks' perspectives on how we have shaped them over the years. And again, I keep saying we, because even though it's like, oh, but that's not me, oh, but it is. <laughs> if you are sitting here with these letters behind your name, if you are sitting here in this profession, it is attached to you. And so being really intentional about understanding that dynamic, I think is the first part of being critical. So there's not only sort of individual positionality, but there's also professional positionality that I think we have to include in how we're thinking about things. Is that making sense? All right. So we're gonna keep, keep rolling. So here's my question to you all. Who are you as a critical researcher? And just, if you wanna take like a minute or two to write that down, what that means for you, um, and then we'll kind of share out. I can go. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it's always hard for extroverts when nobody's jumping in then we just like, I can't take it. So here I am. <laughs> um, so who I am as a critical researcher, I wrote that, um, I think impatience really drives me and I really just want change. Um, I feel, um, time running out, you know, with certain organizations that I have been involved in. I think my background as a school counselor is a part of that. Um, and then in my LPC, I have a private practice and I work um, a large um, percentage of my population is funded by Medicaid. And so I um, am often working with people that have so many systems um, that are barriers. But I've also learned that the easy route is to blame the system or blame the person and I appreciated what you said at the beginning that there's so much more complexity so I'm very invested in the complexities and I don't really know how to proceed so I, I have all this impatience I acknowledge and, and can really get in there with the complexity and don't know what to do okay thank you for sharing that that's oh I can't wait to unpack that <laughs> I'll, I'll share. I think, I think the thing for me that I sit with in trying to respond to this question is I think my own awareness of how, uh, how new, how new to call myself a researcher feels and my own awareness of research is its own, like the research, like the act of research is its own political performance that like occurs within a context. And so I think where I struggle is, oh, like how do I do good research, let alone critical research because I feel like I'm in this place of still trying to figure out how how to advance my own like research agenda or how to like build relationships and collaborations um, because I'm quickly waking up to this notion that research is, is its own ecosystem within our profession within the larger academic discourse um, 
I think that's I think that's what I said with. The words political performance really resonated with me, and I think that there's so much to that um, that is a part of critical methodology. So thank you for sharing that with me. I guess I'm the last of the Wilkins. Um, I guess for me, one thing that I had to really uh, that I struggled with, and I feel like I still struggle with, is that I coming from a position of many uh, marginalized, um, I guess, identities. It has created this understanding of just looking at things quite different than most people. Um, and so it's it's like I come from a, a back way of seeing things. Um, and so I already want to already deconstruct things, not knowing that it's our, that that can be rocking the boat a whole lot um, because I'm already like, wow, why is that? Um, and so where things have already, the systems have already been in place, I'm asking questions or um, analyzing things in which have not had a lot of voice to and being okay to sit within that space. Um, and that's been, it, it's been a, more of a challenge than I thought it would, um, only in the sense that I didn't realize that's what I was doing until I was actually doing it. Um, and so I'm still trying to find my footing in that um, and what that means as a researcher. I think deconstruction is such an important word because that's everything <laughs> of qualitative work and I think in particular critical work. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about is finding your footing. Um, I feel like that's come up a bit throughout. Um, Justin, Gretchen, anything you want to add? Yeah, um, I, I was just thinking about um, having many intersections of privilege and asking myself, can I be a critical researcher if I'm uh, representing so many intersections of privilege? Secondarily, um, I'm also a new researcher. Um, but I'm deeply embedded in the house of medicine right now in healthcare, and I've been a professional counselor for so many years that I have lots to say about the bad side in some ways, I think, and the good side of things like healthcare and as a private practitioner and a business owner, all of that. So those are some of the lenses that I'm coming with. Thank you for that. I think the new researcher, again, that's definitely a consistent theme. And I think, too, the critical perspective of, can I be? Is this for me? Or is this only for those occupying certain minoritized identities? I think that's a common question. Um, and I'm hoping we can engage in that a little bit more as we continue on. Um, because, and I think it's an important question um, and not one that I can answer for you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's a question that you ask yourself on a repeated basis. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Thank you. Anything else, Gretchen? I want to give you a moment. <laughs> sure, I'll chime in. Um, I think I was reflecting on this, and I was also thinking just as a doctoral student, like learning how to own a counselor education identity, I think I also think about how to teach research um, and how to do so responsibly and how to engage in those conversations within like the space where you're talking about research um, and teaching the next generation of researchers how to engage with that. Um, so I think that's because for being a counselor, I was an educator. Um, so I think that's always a piece that, that resonates with me. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess I'm also curious, what was, what was challenging about answering that question of who are you as a critical researcher and what was easy in terms of answering that question? If maybe one or two of you, don't mind sharing. I, I will say for me, um, it is sitting in, I would say having to examine myself um, and look at my positions in, in all of them in its complexities. Um, as I'm currently finishing up, I'm um, doing qualitative research is really sitting in who I am um, and being okay with that. And meaning all of it, the privileges, the the marginalized statuses, the the in the in betweens, um, and being okay with saying that this is who I am and this is what I this is what it, it is coming through, and just being with that part. Thank you. I think it's always hard for me to answer these questions 
also as a new researcher um, and such a strong clinical identity or uh, practitioner identity is that's what I've spent most of my life doing is that I always feel like I'm not going to have the lingo <laughs> or use the words that I like I write down words and I thought like I've never even heard of p political performance like don't even know what that means but wrote it down to look up later or I'm hoping you'll explain it um, and I think I hear a lot of words thrown around, but I don't really often, um, I haven't really thought about them. And so I always feel this nervousness that I'm gonna, that I'm not gonna understand or really not know the language that everybody is using. Definitely that um, sometimes lack of familiarity or at least just trying to, again, to use um, Alicia's word of finding your footing. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and I think that that puts, that always makes this more challenging to think about. Um, so one of the things that I would say, even in asking this question, there's a clear assumption in this question that you identify as a critical researcher. Well, first, just as a researcher, much less a critical researcher. And I think that that, this is to me an example of kind of a crappy question <laughs> because I've made a lot of assumptions about you just starting. And so thinking about when I'm designing a question, when I'm thinking about who I'm speaking to, have I really thought about the language that I'm using? How broad is who are you? My God, like <laughs> we are all in that lovely existential space of questioning who we are. And even with shifting identities and roles um, and context, whether it be counselor, educator, thinking researcher, thinking clinician, practitioner, um, in the medical space, the business owner role, this is a lot this is a lot in a very few words, and there are a lot of assumptions that are attached to that question. And so when I start thinking about doing research, particularly qualitative research, I think one of the things that I struggle with is how are we designing questions that are open enough, and particularly when we're looking at, at it from a critical perspective, when we are looking at minoritized groups who have largely been defined and shaped and languaged by other people, if we put in the language without understanding what that language might mean to someone or how if they identify with that or not, not everyone identifies with the term black. Not everyone identifies with the term African-American. So even thinking about how we language things and how important that is, this was sort of my example of what doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but thank you for playing, good job. <laughs> uh, but to make this even more relevant to sort of the mixed methods way, if I gave you these categories, how would you fit yourself there? And this question probably would have been easier for you to answer if I had given you these categories from the jump. Because then you could say, oh, I'm brand new, I'm emerging, I'm efficient, I'm unsure. You could have easily fit yourself in a box, which meant that you would have gone along with my assumptions. It would have meant that you sort of fell in line with whatever view that I had already set in front of you. And this is the problem with quantitative research, <laughs> is that there are so many assumptions that are embedded into the work that we do, into the research that we design, um, that we oftentimes are missing the actual importance. I am much more interested in understanding how you see yourself as a researcher, and then a little bit deeper, how you see yourself as critical, if you see yourself as critical. All of that is a part of what I need to ask, but if I just make it this simple, I've cut out a huge part of the story and the identity and the experience. And that's part of why people are like, oh, I love qualitative research because I can get so much more of this richness. The hard thing is it becomes hard to compare across groups. Um, and so that's a part of where mixed methods for me came in. So to me, kind of why mixed methods and, you know, this is directly from Cres Creswell, who really gives us a lot in terms of mixed method designs. Again, it's not particularly from a critical perspective, but just some of the basics. Um, we need uh, different multiple perspectives, more complete understanding. So I think of this as a more comprehensive way of understanding anything. Um, sometimes it's confirming, and I like to say not only confirming, but disconfirming, disputing, actively disputing, which is quite often what we're doing in critical work. Um, needing to explain quantitative results that we have. Um, we need better contextualized instruments or measures in order to reach certain populations because quite often we're using 
we are using metrics um, that were, and the best way I can say this is to kind of quote from Ibram Kendi, um, probably the most impactful thing of that entire thick book, if you have never read Stamp from the Beginning, um, A Definitive History of Racism in America, or Racist Ideas, something like that. It's, no, it's at home. Never mind. It's not here. Just kidding. Uh, but that book, I really encourage you to read it. The most prolific thing is from the prologue for me. And he sets it up with a quote, um, a quote from the president of the Confederacy. This was not a country designed by Negroes for Negroes, but a country designed by white men for white men. And the same is said of research. This was not designed for minoritized populations. It was designed by white men for white men or by white men to understand and shape and determine the status of others who did not fall within those categories. And that's an important piece to understand. So when we think about models, practices, measures, interventions that were designed for particular populations, and then, you know, these groups are just not meeting the same standards. Probably not. And so again, thinking about positionality and how we're defining people along um, biased metrics, which is, I'm gonna give you one book that I do actually have with me. White Logic, White Methods, so good. Oh my gosh. Um, there's a lot to really explore looking at racism and methodology. So I encourage you to explore this text as well. It's really, it's one of those passion texts that gets you all excited. You're like, man, I'm gonna buck the whole system of research. Um, and that's, that's part of why I love this book. So I really encourage you to explore this a little bit more. Um, another reason why you might use mixed methods is needing to enhance our experiments. Um, it's really adding some additional complexity, um, kind of like Jenny had talked about in terms of the complexity piece. Um, we need to gather trend data, basically what's consistent across a particular group, um, and individual perspectives from community members, and then lastly, needing to evaluate the successful program, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go into all that. But in terms of the ways that I see this most fitting in counseling, um, typically needing more complete understandings, needing to confirm or disconfirm our quantitative measures, um, needing better contextualized instruments, and I think lastly, needing to enhance our experiments. We are from a space that often does not center research. Counseling is not necessarily known for being the research powerhouse. I love our field, but that's not what we're known for outside of us. <laughs> we think we're really great at research. Unfortunately, the rest of the world doesn't. <laughs> and I think that it's important that we understand that um, because that means that we have to be even more intentional in understanding um, our positionality and our personal and professional positionality but also understanding how we fit into this larger conversation and larger body of work. Okay, so approaching these critically, none of this should be new. This is all really basic um, from the previous webinars too. So being critical at every step of the research process from conception to design, to implementation, to evaluation, it is being critical at every single step and understanding it in the context of power and privilege. That is really what makes this whole thing go. Um, in terms of using a critical mix method approach, we can look at the macro level from the quantitative perspective, and then we can understand the micro level um, through a qualitative perspective. And there's different ways of doing that. And I'll go over a couple of the main ways of designing um, quali uh, not qualitative, excuse me, mixed methods research. Um, and again, very broad categories. There's multiple advanced ways of looking at this, um, but at least the most basic three designs I think are helpful in terms of thinking about what makes sense for your work. Um, using existing frameworks to better understand their applicability and lived experience. Um, we have a lot of frameworks in counseling that may or may not well fit the variety of populations that we're working with. Um, and so being intentional about that. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard the term inviting in. I am in love with that phrase um, because it's, it is essentially the opposite of coming out. <laughs> And I appreciate the importance of that is instead of us saying, so even the example of me asking you, who are you as a critical researcher? Instead, creating the space for you all to share who you are with me and how you were thinking about these topics with me is completely different than me sitting here from my place of power and demanding that you tell me who you are. <laughs> and that's quite often what we're doing in research is that we are coming in and saying, okay, tell me who you are along these frameworks that I have already designed. Thank you. <laughs> and we cut out so much of their power and their agency, which is 
usually just replicating what's already happening in every other space. And that's why it's so important to create that inviting in space. All right, so giving an example, I will share a little bit about um, an explanatory sequential design um, that I did. So just to give you some background, um, the paradigm critical theory, our theoretical lens is intersectionality specifically. And then again, explanatory sequential design, and I'll go over the different designs too. Um, and our methods of data collection were surveys and focus groups. All right, so I was looking at counselor wellness and I joke with this because wellness is not a thing that has ever entered my life. Like it has never been like, oh, team wellness. To me, wellness was a very white thing that like cute skinny white women did with Starbucks coffees and like running strollers and New Balance, you know? <laughs> it was just a very narrow view of wellness until I started understanding it more from a, um, culture specific place uh, from a more image perspective. Um, it may not look the way that it's presented to me, but it is still wellness. And sometimes it, it just looks a little bit different. So that was really how um, I kind of got involved in thinking about wellness. And I started looking at counselors in particular because just thinking about my own space and my own folk, I have a lot of black counselor friends who also suck at wellness. And a part of that is because we tend to focus very heavily on the work that we do and how do we fix this and how do we change that? And how do we dismantle it? But the self-care, the relational care is sometimes missing. Um, and even the ability to, and I, I don't wanna say the ability, but more so the tendency to create space for ourselves in, our, in this critical work was sometimes missing. Um, and so I started kind of with a very basic, like, what's some general content that we know about counselor wellness, we know about burnout, um, <coughs> excuse me, we know about burnout, we know about the, you know, vicarious trauma, we know about all that stuff. I'm not going to go into the details of all that because this should be fairly similar um, or very familiar. But one of the things that I noticed is that I saw in terms of Black or African American, um, and again, using the labels that were provided by those researchers, the numbers in those studies when we were looking at counselors were three to 9% of the sample. Nine was the very highest that I saw at any point. Um, but yet, when I started looking at who's in the profession of counseling, Black African Americans, if you look at Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you look at KCREP, um, vital statistics, looking at around 20, 25%, somewhere in there, I would say roughly 20%, but yet we don't know how they do wellness. And one of the things that we were consistently finding in the research was that there are different ways that um, Black African American identified folks cope, different ways that they deal with um, stress, different ways that they think about wellness, and different resources of resilience. And so thinking about how that was missing from these studies of counselor wellness, um, given that we're trying to diversify our profession, we're trying to understand more about how counselors can reflect the populations that they serve, we're missing some information. And that's kind of where we started. Um, and again, um, I will major shout out my colleague, um, Dr. Connie Jones, because she is more the qual person. And so she and I would just go back and forth of like, wait, help me understand this. And I'm more the quant. And she's like, wait, 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 I wait, wait, wait. <laughs> and it was good to have this mutual growing process. And so in terms of what we were learning, it was uh, very recursive in terms of our own learning, but also thinking about how we were learning more about this topic. So there was a lot more that we were engaging in. Um, because I am required to, this study was funded by Chi Sigma Iota Excellence in Research Grant, because I will get in trouble if I don't say that. Uh, but thinking about it from Black African American health and wellness, one of the things that we were looking at in terms of culture specific coping and looking at how problems are defined and understood is that, <coughs> excuse me, is that we were finding that there are some significant limitations in the ways that we're looking at um, the interaction of race, gender, and socioeconomic factors in terms of health and wellness. And a part of that would be that we'd have a curvilinear relationship with socioeconomic factors. So, okay, great. Um, you would think naturally if you have more socioeconomic resources that you probably are better or better equipped to um, be more intentional about wellness. We find that that with men, we find that it goes up to a point and then sharply decreases. And then we found with women that everything is reported as fine 
always, always fine. Strong black woman dynamic is real. Um, everything is fine. And then all of a sudden we see a big fall off or we hear these narratives and qualitative research that suggests that um, black women are not, um, how do I say this? Um, they're not always having space to talk about their needs and what's happening with them and how much they are taking on. Um, and that we found that it was very significant in terms of um, in terms of their coping, in terms of the way that they talk about issues and problems, and in terms of the way that they continue serving and helping. Um, so there was a lot in terms of gendered race experiences that we wanted to understand. And we, we chose to look at counselors first because counselors know better, right? We, we know all the stuff, we, we know better, we're good. Um, and that's why it was just so funny uh, because we know better except that we don't necessarily do better. But in terms of determining our design, this was our first piece. So the three basic designs of mixed method research are convergent design, where you're really looking at how, like it's simultaneous. So you are not doing one first and then the other. You are doing these data collection processes simultaneously. Um, and so you're trying to explain how these two sets of data are similar or dissimilar. Um, but again, it's at the same time exploratory sequential design is really starting with your qualitative and then moving more towards your quantitative. So how, do, how does what I'm finding qualitatively shape the work that I can do quantitatively? So you're prioritizing one over the other. Same thing with explanatory sequential, you're prioritizing one over the other. So that's typically your first question is what am I prioritizing? Which way of knowing am I centering in this study? Um, and so that is looking at how qualitative data explains your quantitative results. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> qualitative data explains your quantitative results. Um, and so you're prioritizing your quantitative data, but your qualitative data is really used to shed more light and give a more comprehensive understanding of those findings. So we chose to do explanatory sequential design because we figured that again, counselors know better. We know the right things to say. If you ask us the right questions, we will give you the right responses because we're trained. We know what to say, we know what to do, we know how this looks. Um, so in terms of the benefits, it's much easier than the convergent design at times. Um, shock, it appeals to quantitative researchers, which was me all day. So it appeals because it is prioritizing the quantitative perspective, um, but it also lends itself to some newer ways of thinking about um, existing knowledge um, because you're really doing theory testing and then elaboration at the qualitative level. Some of the challenges, it is more lengthy. I will throw that out there. Um, and CSI was very patient with us as well and very supportive of us doing mixed methods research because there is not much that's been done. Um, so looking at it, uh, because it's not concurrent data collection, we had to do the first piece and then the second piece. Um, Sometimes if there's not a clear um, second sampling procedure, you may have to have do multiple IRBs. And we had to go back and do several reiterative processes with IRB, like, okay, well, if you're gonna change this, then we need to have this reapproved. So it, it, again, it just extends the process. Um, the researcher decides which research. The researcher decides which research to prioritize. So that is a challenge because again, from a critical perspective, if it's all my decision, am I really centering voice of the participants? And so that was a part of the challenge from a critical perspective. I don't necessarily know that all mixed method studies who are not coming from a critical perspective would identify it in that way. Um, but again, a part of why we chose the explanatory sequential was we really wanted to understand it from a gendered race perspective. Um, so we came at it from an intersectionality lens, trying to understand um, the social context, um, and not the social context sort of broadly, but specifically the social context of counseling. And so we were looking at counseling professionals, those who were um, master's level at least, um, and so thinking about the counseling context as our social context. Um, we also looked at the power dynamics in terms of gender um, and sort of normed ways of coping, normed ways of expressing difficulty and stress and things like that. Um, so there was a lot that sort of went into why we chose to do 
the explanatory sequential. All right, kind of mentioned this before. So again, we're looking at around 20% of counselors. So we are the largest Black African Americans are the largest racial ethnic minoritized group in counseling. And that's really why we wanted to focus on this group. Um, so our research question, very broadly, what is the relationship between gender, Afrocultural coping and wellness among Black African American counseling professionals? And we left that language fairly open in terms of how people define Black and African American. Um, and we let people pick if this fit or didn't fit for them. Um, so for some people that may have made them more likely to participate, for others, it may have made them less likely. So we also know that our sampling is not entirely um, comprehensive, um, but we were intentional about thinking about using both, both terms um, and allowing people to sort of explain. So if they, we also created some space for if they wanted to describe racial identification, they could also do that too. So we used a hierarchical multiple regression analysis. Very, very researcher heavy. Researcher decides what the order of things are. Researcher centers the entire process. And so you may not necessarily, when you're looking at it, it's like, so how is this critical again? And that was a part of our discussion is if we are centering this in um, our perspective of what makes sense, we know that we are doing it from a position of, um, of power. And so being critical about interrogating that power, critical about seeking feedback um, and perspectives on the research design of does this make sense? How does this fit or not fit? And even, and again, Dr. Jones and I are both black African-American, but we're both black African-American women with PhDs who teach in counselor education. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're not exactly representative in any way. Um, and so we solicited feedback from a number of other folks too, to think about, okay, what makes sense here? And not just those who are within our community, but also those outside of our community. So even our external um, evaluator was outside of the community. Um, and we were curious about their perspective in terms of critiquing and looking at um, what we found in terms of our findings. The second piece is that we used a phenomenological approach and thematic analysis. And we chose to use focus groups intentionally because of how, um, within the Black context, with how language is shared, with how identity is shared, and how so much of experience is shaped through this conversation and not just from an interview, that was one-on-one. -on -one. We felt that we would get more from what participants shared. And again, obviously we didn't do the interviews, so I can't compare them. But one of the things that we observed in our focus groups was how each person built off of the next person. Exactly, this is exactly what my experience was, or mine was totally different because I'm, you know, I'm a married mother of two who, you know, who went back to school at 45 versus a 35 year old professional who has, who has gone straight through, you know, or whatever. And so they were able to speak to similarities and differences within the context of their group with a shared identity. So it's lots of fun. I'm not going to get into every single piece of this, but just to give you a little bit of background about our research design. Um, so in terms of our quantitative portion, that's pretty straightforward. We used Afrocultural coping because we were curious about the um, cultural perspective specifically in terms of different ways of coping. Um, and a lot of the research that we were finding related to race and ethnicity is that culture centric coping is very specific and critical in understanding, I probably shouldn't say critical here, fundamental or important in understanding how people made sense of health and wellness. Um, and not just from a generic wellness, what does that mean? But really thinking about how culture specific coping was a part of informing that. The next piece um, in terms of the focus groups, we had folks self-identify if they would be interested and then we randomly selected from that list. Um, and so from that list, we ended up with, I would say about 10 folks, and then we stratify our focus groups by gender, which was also a significant thing for us because we know from the research that there are very different dynamics and ways of coping related to gender socialization within black communities. Um, and a part of why we did that is that we assumed that we would find some different perspectives related to gender in terms of how people coped, what their 
um, tendencies related to coping and talking about um, issues, we expected those to differ based on gender socialization. The other thing is that we gave folks the space to identify their own gender. So um, we didn't necessarily assume that it was going to be just two groups. Um, however, in terms of um, the responses that we got, we ended up with only two groups. Um, and so we were able to use it based on what people identified um, within, within our quantitative sort of results. I feel like I'm like, like screaming through this very quickly. <laughs> um, all right, I'm not gonna go into all the sampling procedures. We did use purpose of snowball sampling and we had 90 participants total in our quant, in our quant piece. Um, you'll notice here that I have a very clear line. <laughs> Why might I have a line between overrepresentation of women identified participants it's in counseling research? Because our field is predominantly um, women identified. <laughs> exactly. So it wasn't really an overrepresentation. In fact, it was a pretty consistent representation. Um, and so that was one of the things even that I've seen pretty consistently in quantitative research is that they just have, well, statistically that's, or in terms of the percentage, that's over. But in our field, if you've clearly understood your population and your context, which is what you have to do as an intersectional researcher, then this is not over-representation. This is actually pretty consistent representation. And again, we have the context of Bureau of Labor Statistics in addition to our KCREP vital statistics um, to justify that. Um, the thing that we did have a bit of over-representation over educators. Um, so that is the only thing we could say was fairly over-represented. Um, what we found is that um, essentially our final model was not statistically significant, that Afrocultural coping did not make any significant difference in terms of how people identified wellness. That said, <laughs> once we got into the qualitative, stuff got fun. <laughs> um, and I think too, to just give a little bit of context in terms of um, how we did this research, we had four individuals who were involved in the research process. So both myself and um, Dr. Jones, we did not facilitate the groups for two reasons. The first is we thought it was important to have um, someone who reflected uh, someone who reflected the actual um, the identities of the participants to facilitate the group so none of us identified neither of us identified as black african-american men so that did not seem appropriate for us to facilitate so we had a licensed professional clinical counselor who was a black african-american identified man um, facilitate that group same thing with the women's group because we thought it would also shape how we interviewed, how we conducted the focus groups, if one of us um, only did one of the groups and didn't do the other, so it just got a little messy and so it made more sense. All right, so in terms of what we found, in terms of the stressors, we found that family work, value and cultural differences, and the conflict and navigation of those differences were the most significant things um, that came up uh, from the research. Um, and in terms of coping, people describe therapy and counseling, but in terms of how they described it, it was very much like, yeah, that, that we do, <laughs> but don't do. And a part of why we were focusing on it is because it was so significant that they all, as counselors, could identify the importance of counseling and therapy without actually being intentional about engaging in it. So for some, they said that they did. For others, they were like, uh, I mean, most of the time I'm good at it. I may go and check in, but mm, the waffling around it, I think was pretty consistent with what we found reflected in the general population. So then we started to think, okay, well, aren't we really, given that we should know better, we don't seem to do better. But again, a lot of that has to do with our socialization and how important um, thinking about culture specific coping of not utilizing these largely white structures of services that was a part of that. Um, in terms of the supports, one of the things that was really interesting is that in our men's group, they described they're like, oh, my wife, my spouse, my mother, my, always the women <laughs> were these central supports. And in the women's group, they were like, I feel so overwhelmed by what 
everyone needs from me. And it was like, oh, I bet you do, given that all the men are saying that you were their primary support for everything. Um, and so we found that there were some significant dynamics, whereas for the women, their groups of friendships were of same gender friendships tended to be the most significant piece for them. Um, and it wasn't in their partners in the way that it was for men. So again, thinking about some of those dynamics and looking at complexity within, within a marginalized group and then going a little bit deeper to look at the gender dynamics within those marginalized groups. Um, I think one of the things that we found that I think was largely connected to professional identity um, which was often brought up. People were really open about the professional identity and how that shaped how they coped about things, but in a very cognitive way. Whereas when they talked about emotional coping, it was largely culture driven. It aligned much more with what we know about how black people culturally cope rather than sort of the typical cognitive ways that we talk about coping and counseling. Um, so it was just really fascinating to think about how different we found um, different dynamics within the group. Um, the role of connection was really important. Um, and again, we saw this pretty consistently. And yet we did not find that to be a pretty consistent theme in terms of the quantitative research. Um, and then lastly, having to do it all. This was very heavy in the women's group, <laughs> very heavy. Um, but we also saw it in the men's group of largely connected with ideas of masculinity and how significant that was in who I'm supposed to be as a black man in particular. So there was just a lot that we found that was really elaborated in ways that did not connect at all to our quantitative findings. And that was a part of why it was so important for us to do this method in this way. So then I come back to this question of, who are you as a critical researcher? I start with who am I as a critical researcher? For me, being a critical researcher is not about knowing everything, having all the tools to do everything, but more of this continual interrogation process of what's missing, what narrative don't I have, or how am I contextualizing this narrative? And even more so, and I think this speaks specifically to what Dr. Casado Perez shared, how am I getting the participants' perspectives in shaping their narratives, more so than what I've found in the context of the literature? And so those focus groups, I honestly was one of the best experiences was watching and listening to those focus groups because it was so life-giving, not just for us watching, but also for those participants. They were like, can we share numbers? Can we talk after this? Because it was a space that was so unique um, in terms of being able to process all of the things that they were experiencing. And even being given that we found that there were so many gender specific dynamics, the importance of having a gender specific space for that in a way that I might not find as frequently, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize, um, in a queer space. If I was doing my research particularly focused on queer Black African Americans, that gender specific coping space would probably not make as much sense. So it really, th there was just a lot, there are a lot of factors that I think made this um, a learning experience for me because there's so many things that looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish we had done that. I think if we had asked more about this, we could have gotten a richer perspective. Um, but that to me is who I am as a critical researcher, is in a state of becoming. So I would describe myself in many ways as emergent, more than I would describe myself as proficient. And it's that constant learning piece that I think is central to mixed methods research because there are so many ways that you can think about this and so many ways that you can explore this. And so being intentional about questioning and critiquing and challenging for me is what made this meaningful. Um, and sort of took me from that anti-qual to, oh my gosh, qual is making quant so much better. <laughs> um, and my hope is that that's a part of what you're hearing and what you can hopefully see in terms of your own work. Um, so I kind of want to open things up a bit in terms of asking some questions and sort of wrap up my piece. Um, I'm curious what your questions are or things that are kind of on your brain as you're thinking about re reflexivity, insider perspectives, and all that stuff. I'm gonna actually close my screen out here so I can see you all better. Ooh, hold on, I think I just messed something up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, so I just wanna kind of open it up. If there are things that were kind of on your mind as I was discussing or sharing about this and what came up for you all. <laughs> 
And I'll just echo that. Now is your time to kind of jump in with any thoughts or questions that you might have um, based on that presentation. So thank you very much. So I'll, the, the floor is yours. I'll, I'll jump in because I feel like I'm humming with something. Um, there was, I think there's something you, you had offered up just by way of um, this image of you and your co-collaborator here where like you were having this conversation back and forth um, and you would have to slow it down to be able to explain to each other what it is you were trying to attend to. And I think when you had that slide up where even though, even though the model didn't fit, you found that there was multicollinearity. And I think in one, in one way, quantitative researchers may chocolate up to this is a limitation, there's something going on. But I think what, what's exciting about what you're saying is that actually becomes a really helpful way to sort of gap spot and say, oh, what, what, do, the act, like, what do the focus groups say about this? Because then it makes sense. It doesn't get dismissed as a methodological limitation, but it gets really focused on as, ooh, there's some, there's some gold over here that we have to better understand. Um, so I'm just, I'm just humming with that at the tail end here. That that's, yeah, it's cool to see that discourse. Yes. I appreciate you sharing that because I think you probably said it better than I said <laughs> um, in terms of thinking about that dynamic. Um, quite often the limitations of quantitative research are so frequently um, sort of boxed as a thing that we look at over here. But a part of what mixed methods does is it allows you, particularly from the designs where you're prioritizing one um, method over another, you're able to really help not fix, because you're not fixing those, but you're better able to explain and contextualize what you have found um, through these narratives. Um, and you're, you're not worried so much about how representative is, mm -mm. you're just, what does this mean here? What might this mean? And the openness to be able to explore that in a meaningful way, I think is what makes it so powerful. And it's so in essential when you're looking at minoritized groups who often don't get to explain that they just get lost in the numbers. Thank you for that, Gideon. I guess I have a, a question. I'm going through this process, um, being an emerging critical researcher, the way that you kind of defined yourself. How has that impacted the way that you're, as a quantitative researcher, looking at maybe these, some of these scales, like the five-factor wellness inventory and things like that, when you're selecting uh, different inventories? It has made me focus a lot on the limitations um, in terms of who is defining what wellness is and there's sort of this cultural perspective which is kind of embedded in the self and, the, and it's like mm, but there's so much that's not fully expanded on here and so it starts as a helpful way and I go back to here's why we often use mixed methods it's we're trying to confirm or disconfirm these existing frameworks with different populations and so that's a part of what made it functional for me is it was like, okay, here's something that's pretty well established. We talk about it like it's just the duh of <laughs> wellness research. And it was like, well, is it really um, giving voice to everything that we need it to? Um, and so for me, it set up a space to critique and challenge um, what works really well about it and what maybe doesn't. And even some of the things within the instrument, we made some changes, um, again, with permission in terms of, um, in terms of the language. So it was very binary throughout. And so we were like, can we change this item, this item, this item, this item, this item, <laughs> so that we can leave it more open? Um, because I don't wanna assume what people will put here. Um, and so even that, even those kinds of things of just being able to make tweaks within instruments, um, but also identifying the strengths and limitations of instruments. And I think being open to that, to finding that the standard may not explain enough it's helpful to give us a starting point, but there's more to it that might be missing. So that for me was how it informed it a lot better. Um, and I'm smiling at this chat comment, lost in the numbers of white methods and white logic. And it's, it's true. <laughs> um, I, I love how, for me, that book just really connected so honestly um, to the way that we think. When we start thinking about how, um, when we start thinking about racialized ways of communicating, we see largely low context communication where things are very explicit and stated um, 
in white communities in ways that are often understood or not explained as directly um, in communities of color. And so there's just things that are understood. And so how do you measure that when you don't necessarily, like you can't measure what's not there <laughs> or what you can't observe. Um, and so for me, that's why the focus group was so powerful is because there were things that weren't necessarily explicitly said, but, but based on where the conversation went next, you were like, okay, so here's what happened here. And then they were able to make it a little bit more explicit. And that's a part of what that focus group facilitator was able to do was to give voice to some of the unspoken things that were said that were clearly present in the conversation and checking in with those members. Um, it, it made it so much more rich and it was like, oh, we can actually find it. <laughs> Um, the things that we allude to were like said, and so let's let's see, does this fit? Is this what was actually said? And the importance of having someone who was a cultural insider to be a part of the focus group and facilitating that also made it more important too. Any other kind of final or concluding thoughts before I close this out? I just want to thank, okay. thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and, and your energy that you put into this. It just was really invaluable and I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here on a Saturday morning in my space, Saturday afternoon, um, to engage in this discussion because I think this is a fun discussion. So thank you all for being here and for sharing and working with me here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I will formally close this out um, and just say, again, we would like to thank Dr. Adrian Irby for her time and effort um, and also just genuine enthusiasm for uh, this presentation. I think it, it's always exciting to hear people that are excited about research um, and that's the form that we like to provide here within CRLL. So thank you. Mm -hmm.